my name is Laurier. Um, I'm uh, currently a research analyst at uh, Quonium Asset Management. Um, we are uh, an institutional uh, asset manager um, with a quantitative uh, investment model. And um, prior to that, uh, I've been working mostly on NLP. Um, and um, yeah, <laughs> so uh, this is my specialty at Quonium as well. And um, today I'm going to talk about analyzing company filings for uh, stock selections. So um, my talk is subtitled The Practical Report um, because uh, rather than presenting uh, new findings, um, I would like to share with you our experience working with uh, company filings um, um, as well as some of the insights we gained and some of the uh, challenges that we faced in the process from a uh, practitioner's perspective. And anecdotally, um, this was um, the uh, first project at Chromium that was uh, implemented in Python. And I'm happy to say that we're currently uh, rewriting our entire research code base in Python. So this was definitely a success. <laughs> Right, so at Conium, we are always looking for uh, new ways to uh, gain information about uh, stock prices. And um, uh, there's uh, different ways of uh, getting such information from textual data. Um, one of the um, most well-known ways, I suppose, would be from company-related news, such as the one shown here about wire cards, suspected forging of contracts, which broke in January uh, 2019. And if we look at uh, Wirecard's uh, stock value, which is the brown uh, curve you can see in the graph here, you see that there's a sharp drop uh, in the value of Wirecard by 30% uh, when the news is uh, reported. But, um, excuse me, I'm, I can't read my presentation. So, um, uh, but we can also see that this uh, effect happens very, very quickly after the news breaks. Um, so the effect of company news is uh, usually a short-term trading signal. And uh, at Conium, we are more looking for more long-term signals. So uh, we chose to work in another source of uh, textual information, which is uh, company filings. And before I dive into that, I'm going to give you a very brief uh, overview uh, of uh, our stock selection model. Um, so uh, what we are using is a uh, linear model that takes an input, uh, what we call factors or uh, features, I guess, um, that are based on company and stock characteristics. Um, and then we, uh, based on uh, historic stock returns, we learn a linear model uh, or linear model weights for all of those features. And the prediction time, we take the current pitch values, combine them with the weights, and obtain uh, a prediction for each stock uh, of the stock's expected return, which uh, we call alpha. So um, to give you an overview of the factors that are used in our current model, um, the, uh, as I said, the alpha signal estimates the expected outperformance of stocks. Um, based on a combination of factors, and these can be attributed to three groups. The first is value, which measures the uh, stock price relative to company's fundamental value. Uh, the second one is quality, which looks at whether company has stable growth and earnings uh, as well as low debt. And momentum, which is a trend indicator based on uh, historic stock price uh, developments. So what we wanted to do in this project is we wanted to combine, combine our traditional signals with additional information uh, from text data. Um, and of course, these uh, uh, are constructed quite differently. So the value quality and momentum signal are mainly derived from balance sheet data and historic stock prices. Um, and this information is provided by uh, data vendors uh, in a numeric format, which is ready for database import. Um, and when you want to uh, extract additional information from unstructured text data, of course, this requires a more uh, involved process, which I'm going to talk about now. 
So um, as I said, we are looking for a more stable uh, signal and we decided uh, to focus on company regulatory filings um, as also supported by uh, uh, some academic uh, work that we included into our uh, signal. And um, these uh, regulatory filings contain financially relevant disclosures to uh, shareholders. Of course, they also contain tables of numbers, um, but there are some ways to uh, construct signals that focus on what is between the tables, so the text of the, of, of the company filing. Um, and these filings are quite useful because uh, they cover basically the entire uh, US listed stocks because the um, US Securities and Exchange Commission requires all listed companies to submit annual and quarterly reports, uh, which are called forms 10K and 10Q. These reports are freely available in uh, text or HTML format from the ATCA online database. And um, we also did a pilot on international filings. Uh, however, we found that uh, acquiring these reports uh, is much more challenging um, because they're usually only available in PDF or even uh, scanned images uh, and much more costly because there's no central source where you can easily obtain them. So uh, looking at the um, volumes of filing that, filings that we analyzed, um, of course, uh, when we want to integrate our textual signal with our stock selection model, we require historical data for estimation and backtesting. Um, so we downloaded uh, all the available filings starting in 1994 um, and ended up processing um, slightly over 600,000 quarterly reports and almost 200,000 annual reports by 40,000 unique companies. Um, we are also downloading uh, filings uh, daily as they arrive. Uh, and for this, it's uh, quite interesting to look at the uh, reporting intensity, so the number of reports that are filed uh, per day. And here uh, we can observe some clear uh, seasonal peaks, uh, the blue ones being um, the uh, annual reports and the red ones, the quarterly reports. You can see that most firms file the annual reports uh, from February to April, and the quarterly reports are filed in um, May, August, and November. Um, and of course, it's good to be aware of that to uh, anticipate any uh, potential performance bottlenecks. So what's in the reports? Um, uh, all the US regulatory filings have to follow a mandatory structure. And I have sketched this uh, on the right uh, for the annual uh, filing from 10K. So the, these documents always start with a business description that can be several uh, pages long, um, followed by a description of risk factors. Um, so all the risks that the company identifies to the business, um, legal proceedings and other, uh, other sections. There are some sections that only occur rarely, um, because they don't pertain to all the companies and are therefore omitted. We decided to extract separate signals from uh, each section um, because we wanted to give equal weight to the uh, diverse information that is present uh, in the different sections, regardless of their length. We extract the sections using either uh, a regular expressions-based parser, um, which focuses on the section titles, or um, HTML tags when available, where we look at the, um, where we, we identify the table of contents in the HTML and then follow the links to the individual sections. However, this is not always available, so we need the other parts as a fallback method. We also looked at international filings, and of course, uh, there is no unified structure that we could extract from them. So here's our um, document processing pipeline. Um, we download the filings from the EDCAR database. Uh, we then extract the texts, where um, for international filings, we do a PDF to text uh, step or an OCR step, depending on the document's format. Um, for the HTML uh, documents, we filter any uh, non-textual uh, entities such as uh, embedded images. 
And we segment uh, the doc documents into the sections where applicable using our regular expression base and HTML uh, parsers. We finally store the raw sections in an Azure Blob storage. Uh, all of this processing is done in Python. Um, for the historic signal, uh, we computed this in parallel on the Spark cluster using PySpark, but are currently uh, switching over to, uh, to Dask as we found PySpark to be a bit unwieldy. Um, so daily processing can currently be done on-premise and we're switching to uh, a cloud, but we're switching to a cloud environment at Airflow. So um, we looked some, somewhat more deeply at the uh, section extraction coverage. So as I said, we use this cascaded parser and coverage of course is essential for constructing a reliable signal. And we found that uh, with a combined parser, we could increase um, the coverage of extracted sections by 28% uh, on average. So this uh, um, is quite a necessary step that we had to do. And the coverage over time is monitored uh, for the daily extraction jobs to ensure uh, that we can catch uh, any deviations uh, in the future. So to sum up, the challenges in the um, document processing step uh, were mainly the variation in report format that requires different parsing approaches and continuous monitoring of data quality checks, um, the historical extraction that required uh, parallel processing, uh, the spikes in reporting activity that we saw, um, and the pilot on international filings where we found that there's no unified structure and that we have to handle the PDF format or uh, perform an OCR step. And the following, I'm going to focus on the US documents. So let me tell you a little bit about how we uh, constructed the text-based signals. So these have all been published in um, academic literature and we tried them out in our setting. So we start out with a um, sentiment uh, signal that measures the tonality of the text. Um, we do this in a very simple way based on a sentiment dictionary that has been compiled by domain experts. And of course, the intuition is here that negative sentiment would also be a negative indicator for stock performance. Um, readability measures the ease of understanding text. Here we combine several simple metrics such as word length, syllable count, long sentence count, the use of passive voice, the number of complex words and others. And here the intuition is that if the text gets uh, really complex, there might be something that is being obfuscated, for example. So this would also be a negative indicator. And, um, the third metric is similarity. Here we measure the difference between current and past reports by the same company. Um, we do this using a bag of words uh, approach uh, with a fixed English vocabulary and uh, TF, IDF weightings. So we give more weight to the words that occur in few documents only. And here the intuition is also that big changes could potentially point to a negative development in the company. Our final metric is competitiveness. Um, this measures how much a company is perceived as a competitor by others, and it's based on the mentions of firms in the competition subsection of the annual report. Um, we extract all the mentions and then uh, construct a citation network between firms and compute the page rank algorithm um, on this network in order to uh, give a weight or assign a weight uh, to each company. So um, in the following, I'm going to illustrate these metrics, but before, um, let me briefly show you our text processing pipeline. So uh, we start from the raw sections where we apply some pre-processing filtering steps, um, and then uh, process the text into different uh, representations that we uh, need to construct the different metrics so for the readability, uh, we apply a bag of sentences. For sentiment, a bag of words. For similarity, we construct TF IDF vectors. And for competitiveness, um, we perform an entity extraction step in SPACY. Again, everything is done in Python. And for the similarity and competitiveness, um, we require input from uh, the other historic reports, as I outlined before. So let me give you an example of the sentiment extraction. So here we start with uh, some filter text or we filter stop words punctuation uh, and lowercase all the words. So we end up 
with uh, a bag of words, um, where we then uh, keep only the sentiment bearing words. So in this case, it's only negative words. And uh, we compute the sentiment as the number of positive minus the number of negative words, minimize the total word count. And we end up here with a negative sentiment of minus 0.3. For readability, I've also um, found an example in the business descriptions from different uh, annual reports. And um, here we can see that in the top um, example, we have uh, 24 words in the sentence. So this doesn't pass our threshold for a long sentence, which is 25 words, and an average word length of 6.6, .6, average syllable count of 2.0. And in the bottom example, we see a much longer sentence of 67 words. Um, and here we also see an increased average word length and increased um, average syllable count, which all points to um, a uh, lower readability score um, for this example. For similarity, um, I would like to show you an example from the risk factors section um, of the quarterly reports by the same firm, one from Q2 and one from Q3 in 2019. So the first one um, mentions risks about their ability to develop uh, CBD infused beverages and comply with laws. Whereas in the um, second uh, quarterly report, we see uh, a different risk uh, that they have experienced recent board turnover causing uncertainties and potential harm to the business. And of course, uh, if we measure similarity, or we use the uh, cosine uh, similarity um, based on the TFID vectors, we end up with uh, a very low scores between those two documents. Um, so this was quite interesting to look at in the context um, of the recent uh, or ongoing pandemic. Um, because of course we were wondering if there were um, risk factors or if, there, if many firms were mentioning the pandemic as a risk factor. And here we looked at the uh, risk factor section in quarterly reports that were filed in May, 2020. And um, this, uh, the graph shows a histogram of uh, the cosine distance to previous reports. So now it's uh, uh, the sign is flipped around. High uh, means that they're very dissimilar. Um, and here we see a very unusual distribution where a large number of reports uh, show uh, a high distance to the previous report. Um, we, did, we verified this looking at uh, examples, so we didn't verify it for all of the reports, but in all the examples we found um, that there was a new uh, risk factor related to COVID-19 that was included um, in the quarterly report. So uh, this is quite uh, interesting that uh, similarity is actually able to, to capture this. So then we wanted to um, evaluate the potential of uh, the textual signal in um, a portfolio context. Um, and we ran a portfolio simulation of US stocks um, and we constructed a filings factor that combines sentiment, similarity, and readability metrics with equal weighting. Um, the stocks are then ranked according to the filings factor. Um, and here we look, uh, I'll show the um, uh, top 20%, so the top quintile, which is the blue line. And as you can see, it outperforms uh, the benchmark uh, quite significantly, while the bottom quintile, um, so the uh, bottom ranked 20% um, falls, behind, uh, falls below the benchmark. So this looks uh, like a promising signal to us. However, we also identified some challenges uh, with the textual metrics that we hope to address in the future. Um, so at first, there is no mechanism to address where it sends ambiguity or context dependency. Um, of course, there are more involved sentiment um, extraction methods, for example, but here, especially the document length uh, presents a big challenge for applying those. Um, we also uh, observed that the similarity metric uh, does not differentiate between dropping or adding the same text. So, um, and we observed examples of this during the COVID pandemic as well. So uh, we also saw uh, some firms that had a big change in similarity in July because 
they dropped the COVID risk factor, factor actually. And finally, we're using a fixed vocabulary, so any neologisms we're currently unable to capture. So in the end, let me uh, describe a, a little bit more the competitiveness metric. So in this example, um, we could imagine, uh, uh, oh, we could look at the Coca-Cola report, and here we see that a number of um, uh, um, food and beverage companies are uh, included as competitors, and then we apply um, the page rank to the entire citation graph of companies. So this is illustrated here again. So um, the page rank algorithm, of course, um, weights nodes higher that receive a large number of uh, incoming links, incoming citations, um, while themselves uh, having few outgoing citations. So in this case, uh, company B, which is cited by A and C, would receive the highest page rank, um, while uh, the others are a bit lower. And uh, an interesting uh, example from our data um, is, uh, can be seen when we look at Amazon. So uh, in 1999, Amazon was viewed as a competitor solely by Barnes and Noble because of course they were selling books. Um, while in uh, 2019, 20 years later, we see a large number of companies from many different sectors, uh, such as retail, specialized trade, but also software and cloud providers that all mention Amazon as a competitor uh, in their reports. So of course, Amazon is uh, ranked quite highly um, according to our competitiveness metric. We then also tested the competitiveness metric uh, in a portfolio simulation, um, where at first uh, it looks quite promising. Again, you can see blue line, um, but we then ran some further tests and we observed that um, there was a strong bias uh, towards uh, technology related stocks. Um, and unfortunately, when we controlled for this bias um, by standardizing uh, over the different sectors, uh, we found that the, the added value was actually uh, diminished. And uh, unfortunately, um, in our uh, investment approach, uh, we const construct diversified portfolios over the sectors. So we were, we were not able um, to include competitiveness uh, as a signal. So this brings me um, to the end of my talk. Um, I hope to um, have given you some insights about um, working with company filings and also some of the challenges that entails. Um, for us, the main takeaways were that textual signals can be extracted from company filings, um, but that the process is quite involved and requires a technology stack. Um, we've also seen that uh, variation in document structure uh, and changes over time require data quality monitoring to ensure consistent coverage. We've seen that the sentiment, similarity, and readability factor show good results in simulated portfolios. Um, while at the same time, we saw that um, some factors, such as in our case, the competitiveness metric, while promising in an academic setting, um, may have characteristics which may, can make them unsuitable um, to integrate uh, in practice. Thank you very much. And um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them now. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the presentation. And we do have some questions for you. Uh, so let me just uh, direct it. Uh, the first question is, why the benchmark is a horizontal line? Um, so we basically uh, show the index, the cumulative index uh, value uh, relative to the benchmark. So here the benchmark is a horizontal line. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, the other question is, uh, how long does it take to process all historical data and how long for daily processing? Um, so the historical data um, is about, uh, I think, a week it took us. Um, so yeah, so not too long uh, if you do it in parallel. Um, daily process is, um, I think, one or two hours. All right, all right. Uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, what happened between uh, 2016 and 2017 where the portfolio value suddenly shifted up? Uh, that was on slide number 27. Is mm -hmm. it related to the 
number of reports released? Um, so uh, we, we were wondering about that as well. I, I, my, um, uh, uh, my suggestion would be that um, because it gives a lot of weight to those uh, tech stocks, it could be due to the, the tech rally. So those stocks really are performing really well um, after uh, 2016. Um, but yeah, it might be, uh, I guess we, we do need to dig a little bit deeper in that, into that as well. All right, all right. Thank you. Uh, so it seems like uh, these are the only questions that I have for now. Uh, by the way, we still have uh, a couple of minutes left. So if there's any question, please, uh, audience, oh, we got one, we got one. Uh, so the question is, uh, were you able to capture all of the competitor, uh, competitors from the text? Um, so there's, um, uh, I'm trying to remember this a bit more, <laughs> but, um, uh, I think we did we did quite well. Of course, there's uh, there might be some losses um, because, uh, well, of course, that's how NLP systems work. You might always miss some, um, but I found that that space you did quite well in identifying the entities. Um, the challenges uh, or the bigger challenge we found was um, actually mapping uh, the entity strings um, to the um, standardized company names in our database. So there was a lot of um, manual labor uh, and and checking and rechecking involved to ensure that we that we captured uh, or that we got a good coverage. All right. Yeah. I mean. Uh, yeah. Nothing is perfect. You know. You missed some. You got some. So yeah. That's totally understandable. Uh, so we or we got another question. Uh, seems like the question is just coming up. So the question is, how long in the future can you use this text to estimate relative performance as we're looking for long term signal? Um, so I know there are some studies on this uh, in the literature that uh, that found that the signal um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is quite reliable. I don't have a number for you at the moment, um, uh, but uh, you are welcome to hit me up in, in the chat later and I'll try to uh, find it out for you. <laughs> All right, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we are almost at the time. Uh, so thank you, Laura, for joining us today. And it was a lovely presentation. And see you around. Thank you. Bye bye.